What do you want to be when you grow up? Veterinarian, hands down. What? Really? Live on a farm. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Oh, oh well, love it. All the way around. I was an animal or an <laughs> I wanted to be Mine a giraffe. <laughs> what, is that? What, do you, what do you mean an, an animal, animal or? Marine biology. Oh, there we go. Uh, what drew you to that specifically? There was a level of contentment. And I, more probably more than anything, wanted to have that level of settledness mm -hmm. in my soul. I do what I do because I love giving hope to people, because I love it. And I've realized over time that I'm good at it, and it's, it's fun to do something you're good at. I do what I do every day because I am sick of seeing people my age held back by opportunity because of a lack of money management skills. Really, I do what I do because I discovered probably a couple of years ago that it was okay. Um, for a long time, I felt like it wasn't all right to pursue being on stage and trying to be in front of people to help them be inspired or be encouraged or to communicate something to them, I felt like it was a selfish endeavor and selfish ambition. Ultimately, I feel a sense of responsibility as a believer to fight for the people who don't have a voice or who don't have a platform in order to be able to use their voice. I found that I was able to sit with people in some of their darkest, hardest moments, and to be able to walk alongside them as they found what the next right move for them was. All right, let's talk about the journey. So we've been talking a little bit about some of the revelations, and okay, we're starting to wonder, and everybody's got a different experience. Some of us were maybe more clear than others, but we were, we were men and women of action. That's what I know about all of you all. Uh, that's what I admire most about everybody sitting in this room. The journey of, of getting qualified, paying the dues. I'm always fascinated to hear these stories, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that when we talk about purpose and, and, and doing all this, it, it seems very romantic, right? Because you're thinking about the mountaintop, but my gosh, is it difficult, right? And, and, and I don't want to romanticize this. I, I, I want to hear the hard parts of paying the dues. So I'll just tell you, I, when I started in politics, you know, I was working on campaigns where I was making uh, $7.25 an hour as a lowly staffer, and we were sleeping in the bed of trucks yeah. to protect the signs that we were putting out for the chicken festival in Crewe, Virginia. <laughs> and, and, and I mean like brutal hours, 18 hours a day, making no money at all, but it was like battle, right? It was like, yeah, you know what I mean? But it was awfully hard. It was really difficult. That's just one memory that pops out. John, I mean, when you talk That's about brutal. the education piece, and what you've had to go through, a tremendous amount there. I mean, let's, let's all if just jump go, in If here. I could go back and do one thing over, I'm just not big on going back because you can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dude, it was 13 or 14 years of trying to fast forward a process that now that I'm on the other side of it, can't be fast forward. Yes. Mm -hmm. I tried to get wisdom every step of the way I thought, now I know enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I would show up at a house and someone had passed away and you'd think, well, I don't know what to do now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or... I'd have a student come in with an issue and their family was there and like, I don't have the wisdom for this. And mm. so, man, I just applied for 5,000 jobs and had 1,800 networking coffees. And I think back, man, if I had just had peace that mm. I'm on the right road and wherever this ends up is where we're going to be, I would love to do that again. But sure. mm. I think that part is, here's a great story. So there's a website you can go to if you work at a nonprofit of any kind, a university, a church, any kind of nonprofit. And it's where they, you, they, they disclose all the 990 tax forms of all the nonprofits in the country. So I was working as um, a senior leader at a college, 24-7, 365, I was working hard, and I did something that's like the cardinal no-no that I've never done again, and I'll never do it again. I got on that website to find out what my boss made. And they have to, they, they label the top five to 20 oh uh, salaries yeah. of, oh. the, of the employees in these nonprofits. Oh boy. So you can go find out what your preacher makes, whatever. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. So I was at this university. All universities are nonprofit unless they're, you know, for profit. And I realized he made two and a half or three times what I made. Hmm. And I got raged out. Like I'm 30, I'm 28 or 30 or whatever, and I was, I knew everything. I had my graduate degree and it was all fancy. It was in a frame on the wall. I got so indignant. And then this is what happened. Hmm. Maybe two or three months later, I instantly start looking for other jobs. For Forget this place, screw yeah. these guys. They're not, they're paying me. <laughs> and he, my boss calls me in. He's still one of my great mentors to this day. 
He said, hey, you, I'm noticing how hard you're working. You've got something special. I'm going to ask you to start coming to these meetings with me. You're going to sit in the back of the room. You're not going to say anything, but I want you to learn how CFOs talk. I want you to come open up a board meeting with one, one little thing because I want you to hear how board members talk, right? Mm -hmm. And it was about a month in of following him around that I realized, oh, he earns all this money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I, did, I understood, oh, leadership is about carrying the weight of everything. Mm -hmm. And they pay you for the sleep you don't get. Yeah. And for Saturday morning with your kids, you're thinking about, I gotta fire somebody on Monday or the budget's not gonna make. And I don't, so mm -hmm. you, suddenly it wasn't just a job, it was a life. Yeah. And that was the first time I realized, to make X dollars, it takes part of your soul, yeah. right? And then it became, yeah. do I want that life? Mm -hmm. Like I always wanted the title and I wanted the salary, do I want that life? And that was a big shift for oh, me. Sure. So what's yeah. life, what life do I wanna build with my wife and my kids and my family? And that has been a, a the arc there. Mm. There's, such a theme, there's such a theme in uh, people seeing someone. You know, like you watch someone and I yeah. wanna do that or I don't wanna do that. Oh, you yeah, know, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely, because there's a connection to it. Courtney, I, I want you to share some of your story because I'm, I'm friends with several people in broadcast news and I just know it's about as brutal of an industry as possible yeah. when you start out. I, I'd love to know some of the dark days of, yeah. of, of kind of getting qualified and paying your dues. Oh my gosh, yes. Well, I started my career in Amarillo, Texas. And a great place to start broadcast news career. Yeah, yeah market 136 oh. out of 200. <laughs> so you're, you're really on your way up with that. Yeah. Uh, but I started by just showing up. I didn't even, I was not asked to be at the news station. Um, I had a friend who was a meteorologist there, and I said, can you just get me in the door so I, I can love shadow that. people? Nice. And I was starting to shadow and just learn how to write stories and the way that you cut packages together and how you interviewed people and how you found the research. And, and I was doing this for a couple of weeks at this point, and actually a couple of months at this point, and then the news director finally pulled me in his office and he was like, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> I it's love like, that so like much. Ah, yes, yeah. 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 And I was like, work. I just yeah. want to learn. I just want to learn. And, uh, and he said, okay. And so I continued doing this, and then somebody actually, because I finished my degree in Amarillo from West Texas A&M, so I didn't finish at UM, I finished at West Texas A&M, so I focused on broadcasting there. And um, I was in this news class called News One, mm. and it was just like a mock newscast. And because the market was so small, all the news directors locally would come in and watch. And actually, my teacher's assistant was the live shot reporter for the news station I had been shadowing at. So he was the one teaching me all the ropes on how to do things. He gets fired because he's not showing up to work on time. I get called. I'm in a voice lesson at this point because I'm still like practicing voice even though I changed my major. I'm in a voice lesson. I get a call from, uh, or I get a voice message from that news director and says, Cordy, I need you on air in 12 hours. This guy just got fired and you're the only person I want for the job. And so oh, that's yeah. how my whole journey started with that. And how then awesome I, is that? Yeah, yeah. Right place at yes. the right time happened. Yes, yes, yes. The right place I just, at the right time. I, I want y'all to comment on this real quick. I get so sick mm. to my stomach when I hear people say, oh, they're talking about somebody that, that we all know, right, or, or that you know collectively, and they go, oh, well, yeah, something good happened to them. Well, you know, right place, right time. As if the person... <laughs> had no intent uh, that right. they didn't show up and put themselves in the right yeah. place. Yeah. Right. right. I think, Christy, even your yeah. story that you were sharing earlier, I, I just want you to comment on this because I think that's a beautiful thing. You weren't strategizing, but you stepped in and you were in the right place. George, your story, same thing, right place, then the right time happens. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? It's 15 years of behind closed doors, 24-7, yeah. 365. Yeah. I've like George. I was in, want to be a metal. I want to be in a metal band, not a, <laughs> not an alt rock hipster band. But like I want to be so years on stage, learning how to speak well. All that ends up, and then I'm giving a talk to some students, right. and the executive vice president of Ramsey says, "I'm gonna hire that guy." Right. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you just saunter into a thing. No. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's not. It's no. years of yes. this led to this led to this. Yes. Yeah. Um, otherwise, this yeah. this job would bury you. Right. So yeah. Uh, it, it's it always looks like it's the it's the months of just showing up when nobody yeah. saw it. Yeah. And then they say, yeah. "I want you." I think oh, the greatest yeah. compliment that that people can get early on, whatever they're pursuing, is. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Like I, yeah. I that to me, uh, I love that story. I didn't know that story. Uh, I love Christie's stories. I love George's story because uh, I certainly resonate with that. You know, I, I will tell you that 
Uh, when I started out in broadcasting, I'm 33. I got a wife and three kids, and I have no degree, no connections, right? So I've got to run my own business, little small business, just to keep things going. And I remember I was in a really dark period of nothing was happening, and I literally thought I was delusional. Hmm. I mean, like, seriously, Ken? Like, really? You're a little too old for this? This isn't going to happen. You need to probably wake up. And I remember that... Uh, uh, that I'm sitting there in this season and I'm, I'm making some calls, I'm trying to get on radio and no one's returning my call. And I remembered in that moment that uh, three months earlier, I had been asked by a mutual friend to do lunch with a lady by the name of Elizabeth and she was running a nonprofit and she wanted some advice on how to get sponsorships for her conference. And that's what Stacy and I were doing. We were selling booths and sponsorships for live events just to keep myself in the game. Mm -hmm. And I was in a moment of despair, like, I don't think this is ever gonna happen. I don't know how to even get anybody to pay attention to me. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that lunch, and I don't know why I remembered it, but in that moment, I remember Elizabeth at one point saying, my family owns a radio station in North Georgia, but I had totally forgotten about it. And I remembered in that moment, I called Elizabeth up. And I mean, I'm literally ready to quit, to just say, this is a waste of time. And I called her up. And I said, she answered the phone. I said, hey, Elizabeth, Ken Coleman, do you remember having lunch? She goes, yes, yes, thank you so much. It was so helpful, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I got to ask you a question. You said in that lunch that your family owned a radio station. Where is that again? And she said, I said, oh. She goes, well, what can I do for you? I said, well, I've been calling Joel, I won't say his last name, the station manager for months and sending him emails and he won't return my email. And I just really would like a conversation with your family. If you're, She told me her brother owns the station. Hmm. I said, I would just love one meeting. And I'm willing to pay my way on, but I just need a meeting. She goes, I wish you would have asked me sooner. She goes, I'll be back to you in an hour. Wow. Uh. And she called her baby brother hmm. and said, give this dude a meeting. Hmm. And then I had the meeting, and he said, of course, you can pay us to be on. Yeah. <laughs> Deal. 250 bucks an hour, he didn't care. Yeah. And, uh, and I tell that story to say that, you know, it's like sometimes we have opportunities all around us, and we don't see them initially, yes. but it's just staying in the game long enough yeah. for something like that to happen. Yeah. yeah, You know what I mean? And I think that's true of all of our journeys. I mean, I'm just curious. You got into the worship yeah. game, and, yeah. and you're starting out as an intern. At what point does an opportunity or a person come in and go, hey, just like with Courtney got the call, did that happen to you? Yeah, I mean, ministry, the name of the game is survival for the most part, right? Yeah. I mean, I, my first year I was working 40 hours plus in ministry and then another 25 at the local coffee shop just to survive, just mm -hmm. to stay afloat. And what I love that John talked about is I, I came to a place where I was over minimizing the work because I think that was a part of it is like, you just think, oh, I just need to grind it out and it just goes nowhere. But there was a moment, maybe year two in ministry, I'm going back and forth playing for a room full of kids that didn't want to hear me and then a room full of teenagers that didn't want to hear me. <laughs> and I'm doing that twice a morning and they're just like not, not feeling it. And I was so done. I was like, why am I doing this? I'm not making any difference. Like what is, what is the point of all this? And, and God spoke to me, he said, is it not good enough that I've just invited you? Mm. He said, your reality is someone else's dream. And it just hit me like, oh, oh wow, okay. That's good. Um, that's maybe good. I should have a little more gratitude, just yeah. appreciate that. And that made the toil because then it was another 13, 14 years before that really started to evolve where being asked to, to do more things, hey, can you take on this? To the point where then I was training other worship leaders as we were then sending them out to campuses. Like that was my job before I left was you've done such a great job stewarding in the little, now we want to give you more. Yeah. Um, but in that time, I, I also found that I was taking that dream that I had and I was slowly just ticking it down. Like, oh, that's still just a pipe dream. That's just something nice to think about, but the, the work is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until um, The Greatest Showman that that dream was reawakened. Um, Take me there, because that's, oh, that's, 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 that's all gonna. I gotta tell you all. Yeah. It's a tough, John, have you seen this movie? Yes. I, I knew you hadn't seen it. Not. Oh my I haven't. Gosh, it's so yeah. good. First of all, it's like free for you to watch, so just do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Seriously though, take second it. Second of all, yes. Didn't expect it. I have a friend of mine had seen it like twice in the same week. I'm like, okay, dude, chill. It's like, no, no, no you, see, you need to see the movie. You need to see this movie. It's like, all right, let's go. So we went, 
And somewhere within the second song, something lit up inside of me. The song was? Uh-huh. And the song was Come Alive. Yeah. Mm, so and, right? You're like, oh, it's a little bit on the nose, so but go ahead. I know, right? Thanks. <laughs> so Come Alive is playing the, the whole thing of like, it's an era piece, but they're using modern lyrics. They're talking about zombies, but they're dressed like they're from the 1800s. It's like, makes no sense. But the idea that I had taken a dream and I let it die. Mm. And it hit me. I was like, wow. Wow, okay. And the whole uh, enjoyment of performance, of music, of creativity, of art, of dance, of all of it being put together so that it could inspire somebody to chase after something, that got reignited. Mm. That's and, awesome. And it was small. It was a small little yeah. spark. Yeah. But that began something that would then grow and just evolve. And that's, here's what I want people to hear. That's mm-hmm. not very long ago. No. How many years? Three years ago? Yeah. And how old were you at the time? Oh, gosh. Spoiler. Uh, I was like 36. 36. Yeah, I just, I just think yeah. that's phenomenal. 36-year-old guy who's a serious dude. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like you yeah. were floundering. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that, that has to lead to here. Mm-hmm. And, and I love, the, I love the, um, what you said about I had let the dream die. Yeah. I, I want to press in there. Why do you think you let that die? Or we're letting it die. Here. Yeah. Um, it, in church, specifically, and I'll say this based on my experience, mm-hmm. there's a tension that you have to try and manage between being really good at what you do on stage, mm-hmm. but also being humble. Yeah. You, you can't get too big because then it becomes about you. Mm-hmm. And at the, it was really the fear of becoming something I didn't want to be. I let my dreams die. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I let myself only get up to a point and then stay there. And so I would not experience high highs or low lows. I would just stay in that middle space. Yeah. And then what we've found over the last two years is that's called apathy. Mm-hmm. What the Bible describes it as is being lukewarm. Mm-hmm. And that is exactly the space that I was navigating in because it felt safe. Yeah. It felt like, okay, well, if I don't hope really big and chase after it, yeah, maybe I won't get somewhere I want to be, but I won't experience the pain of failure. Mm-hmm. And so I let the fear of failure keep me from chasing after anything good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So can I lean into that for a second? Can I ask yeah. you a question? I have other questions. And everybody, yeah, good. Let's <laughs> go. It's real good. That's what good. I know is yeah. if Suzanne had seen me speaking 10 years ago, right. speaking would have been about the same. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I could not have handled this. Mm-hmm. Right. I would not yes. have been from a wisdom, yep. from a knowing what you're talking about, from an ego, mm-hmm. from an a- able to handle it. And so what I noticed about myself and a lot of the college students I've worked with is they get to be 24 or 25 and they want it all now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a level of wisdom that comes from finding out what do you actually want to do and what does this dream actually look like and I've let myself down and how do I get myself back? You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yes. Is that fair? Oh, 100%. Yeah, if I, if I would have got rich and famous at 24, I'd be in a heaping mess in a back alley oh, somewhere. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll say amen to that. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. oh, for sure. Rachel? Okay, well, I was going to ask, though, and you got whoever pop in, but I feel like, Christy, actually, we talked about this on the show yesterday, mm. but your, your identity within your work yeah. is yeah. a big conversation, right? And it's almost like you were trying to protect in a means of a good, it was good spirited, I would think, of right. like, I don't want to become the, you know, and I'm like, and I, str- that's a tension I play every day of my life, because mm-hmm. I've always said, if all of this hits the fan, I always tell my husband, I don't want you to have to put me in a padded room at Vanderbilt, because <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know who I yeah, am. Right. Now, so I, so I, I, in the name of being, tr- trying to stay healthy or trying to let it be an open hand yeah. mm-hmm. opportunity life, I, how do you not seek into apathy? How, how do you balance it out? How do you balance the identity oh, yes. piece is not in you, but yet you are gifted, you love what you do, you have passion for it, but yet uh, there's a humility piece, like, right? Well, I tell you how, how I've never... How do you do it all? Yeah, yeah. And this well, is for anyone, not just a public face. No, no, no I, I, I love it. I love, yeah, yeah, John, jump in. But, but I just want to frame it, though. It's what I heard you say, correct me, is that... Um, you were trying to be humble for the place that you were in, and you were getting confused. You know, there's a there's a tension, well, and then confusion between I need to be humble, yes, but I love performing. I want to do more, but I don't want to make it about me, and that is a natural tension. Is that what I'm hearing? So that was a season, right? Yeah. Once I got through probably seven showings of The Greatest Showman, I came to <laughs> <laughs> real talk. I came to a piece about starting to pursue that again, growing the, the craft, stewarding that gifting that I had neglected. Yeah. That's where there became a tension within the place I was at because it's like, 
uh, we don't know what to do with this. Yeah. You know, uh, a, a how do you decipher if that is self ambition versus yeah. versus like a a holy gifting that you're stewarding, mm-hmm. and then all of like the entanglements. See, with that's it. really yeah, good. So, that's so, my well, point. So the there's, environment there's, is there's, interesting. There's yeah. a really strong pressure, and I will just speak to it from my perspective in the last like five years. There's a really strong pressure in the church world mm-hmm. of some ideas around performance. Mm. Yes. And so, and that's true for speaking because I've worked with pastors on their talks on helping them write a talk and talk through a talk. And there's this there's this belief, whether it's spoken or unspoken, that if you practice a talk, if you tell a story you've told before, you are not authentic. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not genuine. Right. It is you're not manipulating. heartfelt. You're, you're manipulating. Right. You're a performer. Mm-hmm. And the approach that I've always had, which I've coached people on and talked through is, this is no, in light of what we do, is no different than a worship leader that practices a song. If you're going to sing, you practice a song, you warm up your voice you, because you want to make the most impact possible. Yes. Yeah. And so Correct. if your heart is in the right place, that, but I, I could totally see that where it's very much, there is a fear, there is a, mm-hmm. man, a huge resistance to any ounce of, it's about you, you it's a performer, you've told that story before, it's yeah. not authentic. And I'm going, if I've told that story before, it makes it no less authentic. When I tell a story about something deeply personal yeah. and I mm-hmm. tear up because it really is deeply personal, yes. I mean it as much the fifth time yep. as I did the first time. Yeah. Right. And and just because you practice that doesn't take away from the authenticity and the intent and the That's impact. Good. So I can see how you would be in that going, yeah. okay, I feel like God calling me to stretch here and grow here and pursue this. And yeah. someone's going, oh, it's about you. And you're like, it's actually not. Mm. But I'm trying to stretch. You yeah. know, I yeah. can totally yeah. see that. Well, and a big piece to that is we've sort of dubbed, like, oh, I'm going to speak from the heart. It means I'm going to improvise it. A hundred, as if you you must not prepare. That's that's completely bogus. Like, the, the most impactful sort of ground, foundational things that we have are, like, these hymns and these authors and these books where they have spent hours and hours and months yes. and years toiling over the words. Yes. And that is more of an indication of what's in your heart than yes. just sort of speaking out of the cup. That you care enough to work on it. Yes. I saw a thing recently. Jerry Seinfeld worked on his Pop Tart stick for two, two years, years. Yes. Yeah. for a two minute. Yeah. How yeah. much more the is the important? Yeah. Yeah. There it is. So John, for you though, craft. for you, so, the identity piece. Yes. So work. I want to hear what here's the big shift for me. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it changed everything. So to answer your one a question you asked a minute ago, I remember being 16. Me and my buddies worked at Burger King, and we loved that job. But what we would do is we would create songs and re- we it became we got 15 seconds to make somebody's day and that was just my friends clowning around and we used to sing at the drive through hmm. and I'll never forget this woman came through and it was in a crazy rush and we weren't singing and we were just taking orders and she got up to the thing and she said I'm visiting my husband in the cancer ward down at the street at the hospital and y'all aren't singing today and I've started coming through just to get a drink <gasps> so I could hear you and I remember going Oh, I like that. Yes. I like being a bridge between hurt yes. and a little moment. Yeah. So fast That's forward, awesome. fast forward to I want to be a psychologist, mm-hmm. and then I realize well, it's actually quicker to go be a counselor, and now I'm a dean of students at a college. It's when I stopped putting my identity in what is the outcome here. Yeah. I need this title, this amount of money, I need That's to wear right. these clothes right. and drive this car. That's right. When I quit that and it became about the process. That's it. What is the way that I can help the next person that's walking that's right. alongside me? That's right. And I help them by working on this as though I'm building a home, except yep. I'm building a talk. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take care of my body. Yep. I'm going to be a good husband and a dad so that whatever I show up, whether it's in a home, mm-hmm. in front of students, on a stage, then it will work out. That's and yep. then out of the, out of the yeah. blue, Suzanne shows up, and I end up here. Yes. And yeah. then a year from now, yeah. let's be honest, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever I end up is next, hacking it. We'll still, the, my, my purpose will be the same. It will go away. The job title mm-hmm. will look different, yes. right. but my purpose and mission will yeah. stay the same. Okay, is there, is, there, so, is there a danger in your identity being in your purpose? No, no, no because no. if, uh, like, it's about out, if I go to jail, I hope that I'm the guy like, hey, let's, let's yeah. get in a circle, guys, in the yard and talk yeah. about it. It how y'all doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's going to yeah. be. Yeah. So what you can't do is, is allow your entire self-worth to be attached to your salary. Implication. Your yeah. salary and external titles yeah. and things like that. that. Stuff, yeah. You understand what I'm saying? It's like when I go home, I'm not Ken Coleman, host of whatever, or author. I'm right. husband and I'm sure. dad, sure. or I'm brother, I'm friend, and today I'm teammate. Yeah. So I think a lot of people get all confused in it, but it's when we start to focus on the wrong things. I think, John, what you're talking about is he's, he, his identity, which is healthy identity in work, is when you're the bridge. Is in a mission. That's right. That's it. You're not the bridge. In it's not how many, people, how many people bought my book or whatever. And it's like, for Christy, just come off a super successful event. 
it's about what you do in those days. I watch those Instagram posts, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I get a little choked going. I mean, it was what happened in that room for you. Yeah. It's well, and not all the other things. Like, no, it's in not. That and I think for me as a, as a person of faith, as a believer, I know that my job is to do all that I can with what I have. Mm-hmm. And to your point, trust God with the outcome. Yes. If I was faithful on stage and not a single life was changed, I would be like, okay, like God, like you're, you're God is yes. going to create the transformation. I don't create the transformation. Yes, right. I'm going to be faithful right. with the stage, the book, the thing in front of me today. That's right. And there's a there's an element of, and I'm going to trust God with the outcome of that. And so when it's amazing, I'm not going. I'm so awesome. Right. I am a superstar. I am a life changer. I never think. God did that, and I just got to have a front row seat That's to be it. His mm-hmm. vessel. And so yeah, I think when I get crazy about the deadline, <clears throat> right? I need this title or this amount of money. Right. What I find is that's when I cut corners. That's exactly. Yep. That's when I fudge a little right. bit on my resume, or I'm like, no, I, I can do that. Yeah. Right. And I find myself right. way over my head. That's it. It's mm-hmm. let's just walk along the process. And money is always taking care of itself. That's right. The yeah. jobs have always taken yep. care of themselves if you yep. really yep. hone in on, on your craft. craft. I want to point out the flip side to what Christy just said. There's tremendous, tremendous depth in what she said, but we got to focus on the downside. So what happens when you, in your business, your side hustle, or in your new career, uh, and you've got a big idea, you got a big dream, and it doesn't turn out the way you want it to turn out? It doesn't change your purpose, and that's yeah. the identity yeah. issue. Sure. It doesn't change that you still have value to bring. Right. Hello, welcome to the dance. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've never read about a woman or a man that was successful that didn't have any failure, right. yeah. didn't have any restarts and reboots. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's the issue. Yeah, it's I like, guess my, my always my struggle a little bit, and I feel like maybe even in America, because we're so utilitarian and like, ugh, it's like a culture is like putting so much worth in something that can mm-hmm. be gone, change in a second. Exactly. So yeah. I think yes. that... Yeah. Yeah. That what what is out there, the the result of whether I'm a stay at home mom and I befriend people and and walk them through right. certain things, or I'm performing on a stage, like right, whatever the avenue is, yep. yeah. it's about serving other people, mm-hmm. and I feel like yep. that's up. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. And cool. the balance for me, You're is absolutely right. Make really audacious, bold goals, and I hold them really loosely. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I want to sell a million books. Yeah. And if I sell a thousand, yeah. Yeah. my wife still loves me. Yeah. I'm still a great Right, dad, right, right. right. What's well, next. every yeah. one of us in this room has been more touched by either an Instagram DM post from somebody that you had some positive impact on or meeting someone at a live event or reading an email or taking a call on your show. Sure. I can just tell you, tell me if I'm wrong, I don't mind being wrong. Each one of us in this room has had, has felt that, and that has meant more than any positive so can, result as it relates to selling something. Or something. Yeah. Yes. Those mean more to me. So tell me, so people like that might be viewing or listening to this right now, though, may not have a front-facing That's right. position or job. So speak That's into right. the person that, you oh, know, I whether they, they, they own, like, a heating and air company, or like yeah, what, right. what they're doing that feels yeah. mundane, but the yeah. purpose they can have. Because yeah. some people, they don't have the opportunity yeah. to go and sell. You know what I mean? Well, like, I'll tell you my favorite story. We shared the story on the show recently of a janitor in the Northeast. It escapes me what city it was. But um, she's been a janitor at a public high school for 20-plus years. Mm-hmm. And she's had such an unbelievable impact on the community, they did a full story on her. So I mm-hmm. picked up the story, and I read it, and I was weeping as I read the story, and here's what happened. Uh, 15-some years ago, she's... Uh, First one at the school, early morning, bitter, cold winter morning, and she's opening up the school and starting her routine. And she's in the cafeteria, and she hears a knock on the door, and she goes to open the door, of course, and there are two teenagers. um, Yep. um, They're homeless. Mm -hmm. And their mom dropped them off because she's got to go She's just working to keep them alive. They're living in the car. And so she has to drop them off yeah. first thing in the morning to hope they can get into school and not freeze to death because she can't be with them. And so she lets them in, of course, and she hears their story and she realizes just the basic needs they have. And so she takes care of them. She gets some breakfast and everything. And later that day, while they're in class, she decides to clean out one of the janitor closets that she puts her supplies in. And she puts toilet paper, toiletries, mm-hmm. shampoo, yep. everything brings some old sweaters, goes around her neighborhood, and just starts collecting stuff that you would see at a Goodwill store, and she stocks the closet, primarily for those two Mm. kids. Mm. But then they start talking about it, and it begins to spread throughout the school. And to this day, that janitor's closet has turned into a mini grocery store. Mm. And so when you ask me that question, I go, that's purpose. Like, she's cleaning toilets 
and they interviewed her in the story. She goes, I really love my work. I'm an organized person. I like cleanliness. Mm. But we think of janitor as this low bar, right. this awful, you know, like, you. this is the worst you could be. And she goes, I actually really like cleaning things, mm. and I take honor in my job. Right. And then one day she gets the opportunity, and it's not about cleaning, mm. and it's not about being a janitor. Like, she's on purpose. Mm. When we talk about purpose and contribution, it's not about title, it's not about salary, it's not about sales, mm -hmm. it's about did you make the contribution that you were put on this earth to make? And I would suggest to you, she's done that. Yep, yep. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, so, I think so many people are empty because they chase the salary and the titles and they don't know why they got yeah. the yeah. the golden handcuffs and they're not happy. And they're like, but I, but I make this great, you know, great salary or great yeah. title or whatever and they're still unfulfilled, and it's because they're missing that piece of it. Yeah, yeah. That's a, I had some, some some neighbors that we're getting to know. We moved, and we're getting to know some neighbors, and a guy was over, and he said, I was like, so tell me about your work. I know he worked in the public schools, and he said, I'm the associate director of tech, and when teachers have problems in their classroom with the computers, whatever, they call me, and he said, I'm in my dream job. Yeah. Uh, and he's yeah. a veteran. Yeah. Mm. And he's this, doesn't make a ton of money. No. It, but he was just telling me about helping awesome. out people with their smart boards. And, yeah. their, <laughs> and it was like talking to you guys, like we mm. just got off stage. And I thought, if you could bottle that up yes. Yes. and sell that. Yes. yes. Mm. It's, that's, it's just, you want, I just, he has no ambition to, I don't want to run the tech department. That's no. for other people. I get to go help teachers. And yeah. it was like, man, yeah. how yeah. cool is that guy? Right? It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. And the uh, hard thing is, I feel like like that stuff is not applauded. No, and I'm like, that's right, what right. I, so I used to tell right. my, That's what I love what Ken does. It's yeah. like he gives the applause. That's the yeah. applause. It's yeah. when you find that purpose. Like that, yeah. that's what's applauded. But it goes so, so counter against yeah. what it's we celebrate, right? right? And I, I used to tell my staff, I cannot go to work as the chief student affairs officer in my suit. I cannot be here for two weeks and nothing changes. That's right. And the folks who are taking care of the food and our bathrooms, if they miss a week, this mm -hmm. place grinds to a halt. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right. let's not forget who's the most important person. Right. right. And well, I think, Love that. I do, I think we get it dumped up, up yep. upside down. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. totally. Mm -hmm. John, I want to circle back to something you said a minute ago because I thought it was interesting. You were talking about, you tried to fast forward the wisdom you got. You know, you were getting all these degrees, but you tried to fast forward it. So I've seen this pattern with um, a lot of people I work with where they feel like, they almost feel like they can't do anything mm. until they get a piece of paper. Mm. And they want this permission. And sure, like if you're a surgeon, you need to be qualified, right? But like you just showed up. Mm -hmm. You just showed up at the at the news station. Yeah. Kind of put me in coach. I've never taken a public speaking class in my life, mm. but I have 12 years of being on stage and getting experience. So I just wonder mm. what what are your thoughts and Ken, your thoughts on what is the, you know, balance of like, yeah, there's some industries where you really need a piece of paper. No yeah. one's going to let you yeah. right. operate on them if you have not gone to medical school. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like, I think some people swing to the extreme of sitting around waiting on the piece of paper, yeah. especially yeah. in industries that you don't need it, where That's it's like, right. you're going to figure out how to do the job mm -hmm. by doing the job. So what does that look like yes. where we need to take action, but also, yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. you do need a piece of paper. I don't In know. my world, it's been both and. Okay, yeah. Is... If I just run out with a bunch of enthusiasm and a couple of cool cliches right. in the middle of the night, I can hurt somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. So I need to have spent a couple of years grounding myself in who am I, why, what are the theories behind what I'm doing. Right. So that's really important. Right. And I can sit there and read a book all stupid day. I got to start showing up. And so very similar is I just started doing ride-alongs, yeah. right? I had a buddy who was, had a small program with the police officers. And that informed my work at colleges. And I started asking my students one that one more question when they came and said, hey, I'm struggling with my disability services. And then just going, are you okay? And they'd go, no. Ooh. And right, and so it all worked together. Um, but for me, it's been both and. And anytime somebody on either side is, you don't need any of this stuff, yeah, you do. Right. And somebody who's like, all, if you can't don't have this piece of paper, you're nothing, you're an idiot too. Mm. And so for me, it's yeah. always been yeah. both ends. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, I, I would add that, you know, in, in broadcasting, Courtney and I, that's that's kind of our trade and background. And, you know, the degree itself doesn't matter that much. Um, and it's really learning the trade. And I think that what's so hard for us as humans, I know I struggle with this big time, is that we all want the thing now, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So we want the shiny thing. <clears throat> and we're like, are you serious? I'm gonna have to take this class. I'm gonna have to do this. And I gotta go through all this. And that's just natural tension and that's okay. Cause we all want the thing, but then it's like, oh, I have to go through all this, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. And I gotta tell you, in those moments, and I've been through that, I know you all have too, I just, 
remember that I was like, how bad do I actually want this thing at the end? Like, how bad do I want to get up the mountain? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if I want to get up the mountain, I'm going to have to train. I'm going to have to buy the equipment. I'm going to have to learn how to use the equipment. And I remember this great line in this movie called The Great Debaters, and Forrest Whitaker's the father, and he tells his son in this argument at one point, he's on this debate team that they're, they're uh, going for the national championship, and he's spending all of his time on debate, 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 and he's a great student. And there's tension, he's not getting his studies done. And the kid's like, Dad, but I'm, I'm basically a stud on this debate team. And he says, you do what you have to do so that you can do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think for me, I had to learn that because it was really, really hard. I wanted so bad to be on air, and now I look back, mm-hmm. and if I had not done the basics, like this broadcasting class with a bunch of 20-year-olds, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have gotten the opportunities that I've gotten because mm-hmm. I could actually do the basics. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's the key, mm-hmm. is to understand the basics, the fundamentals, all of that stuff, you've got to do that in order to do the thing you want to do. And then here's the deal. You'll look back and you'll go, those were some of the best times when I learned Mm -hmm. that I could actually do it. Like when you started speaking, you realize I can actually do this. And the more you speak, the better you get. You have to pay attention to those experiences. Because like you can be on stage and you tell a joke and no one laughs. You're like, okay, (laughs) learn from that. Mental note, don't tell that joke again. But what I love in the pattern of all of y'all's examples is you point to these moments or these people or the greatest showman or I saw you know I saw this person doing what I wanted to do. We learn from them. Mm-hmm. A lot of people can have those moments and they don't learn from them. And mm-hmm. so I love that like if you let pay attention to the themes of your life, pay attention to what makes you light up and come alive. And yes. some people are just walking around and they don't pay attention to those moments. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's something in that too yeah, of like learning from. Well, you and I were just having learning from that lunch yesterday, and we were talking about your event, Business Boutique, and how that felt being on stage, and then there's an event coming up, how that felt on live stream, and you're like, how are you feeling, how is your body feeling in that moment? Like, what were you feeling when you were on that stage? Did it feel good to you? What did you love about it? Yes, yes, yes. and it was really good for me to understand, okay, I can be really good at something, but do I love it? Mm -hmm. Because I think that Mm -hmm. sometimes we, well, at least for me, my whole life, I did the things that I was just good at. I was good at singing, so I did it, and I loved it, but also I was good at it, and I needed to be good at it in order for me to love it. And broadcasting with the news, I was good at it, and therefore I loved it. But then I realized as I stepped back, I hated it. Like, I I still have trauma from it. (laughs) And so I think also, too, like, as we get clear about what we want to do, sometimes we just deviate naturally toward the things that we're instinctly good at, but maybe it's not what we want to do. Like, I don't I don't want to be in the news. I, like, don't put me in the news anymore. I don't want <laughs> Please, dear Ooh, God. Yes, I have the most credentials and qualifications for, for it. So we'll but like, that, that would literally suck the life out of me today. And yeah. so I think it's, you know, I, I went on a huge rabbit trail with this, but I think it is also important. Yes, you can be so qualified in something. You could have spent so much time doing it. You could have 12 years of speaking experience, but then there might come a time where you're like, hold the freaking phone. I don't want to do this at all. Yep. And for me, that was my experience in the news. I mean, yep. seven years of pouring myself into this. I was just trying to reach this pinnacle, and I was in Tampa in the 11th largest market, and I was making good money, and I realized I freaking hate this, and I'm about to go insane. Mm-hmm. And then the whole identity portion, I just crumbled. I left, and I realized all of my deposits were in that job. All of my deposits were in what I could be as a journalist. Um, And that's where I had to reprogram myself. I had to learn who I was, which, you know, has been a five-ish year, four-ish year journey of that and realizing the things that I love. And I still feel like I'm kind of an infant. And what are the things that light me up? Are you enjoying what you're doing? Okay, yes, you're great at live stream because I did camera work for seven freaking years. I should be good at it or else we have a problem. But like, is that what you love? Is that what your body is actually telling you that makes you happy? And I think, Courtney, that piece, when you love it, circles back to doing the things that we always say don't despise humble beginnings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But you can get through those humble beginnings because you love it. Like That's when it. you are in that, it's That's like it. it is. And and you know, we laugh about our early days of that summer. And then for about two full years, I call them my Nebraska years yes. because I was in Nebraska all the time. Somehow, every, everyone in Nebraska, <laughs> Nebraska needed yeah, Rachel. And there was always a connection, a connecting flight. You never could get there. And I would get in a little rental car and drive to Kearney and Maco- all these random little places and then come home. And then Nebraska would call two weeks later and I'd be back in Nebraska. I don't know how it happened. But but I, I loved it, though, so yep. much that I almost didn't realize— and I was so young. I was 21. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I didn't know it was supposed to be any different. Mm-hmm. And so— 
you know, we even laugh about that summer, me and Christy traveling around, and we, you know, they would, <laughs> if they're watching this, they're probably like, <laughs> these girls are so not <laughs> grateful. But they, like, all, like the situation of our even sleeping arrangements oh. were bizarre and the most, and we had to make up our own, all of this. Anyways, but we mentioned it to someone here at the office, and they were like, we have two young girls traveling, and they don't even have, like, proper sleeping, like, and they flipped out, and me and Christy were like, I mean, we know it's like kind of a thing, but it wasn't that big. Or for me, I was like, it wasn't that big of a deal. It's just what you do. Right. I, I didn't know any different. Do you know See, what I'm saying? I love that. And there's a level of probably my age and experience that caused that. But also, I loved it. Not as much mm -hmm. that summer. By the end of that summer, I think. <laughs> but, but those Nebraska years or those cafe talking in a cafeteria when yeah. I was used to, at 15, I yeah. was in arenas and people mm -hmm. would, yeah. I mean, I could fall on my face, but those people paid to see my dad. So when his young daughter comes out, it's just like, <laughs> I want everyone. And I was like, this That's is right. great. And then I'm in with a microphone and like a short cord yeah. in a cafeteria where no one cares, no teenager <laughs> cares to hear. And I'm like, but I didn't really care even no. because I you loved, loved it. it. You know, just curious, mm -hmm. who comes to mind? Somebody that believed in you, said something, offered an opportunity. And he just said, you know, you could do that. Oh. Mm. And I said, no. And he just walked away. He said, yeah, you can. He walked away. That was it. It was a mm. two. Wow. And I can, y'all, when I close my eyes, I can like be back mm. in those yes. little khaki pants and big <laughs> oversized shirt and thinking there's no way. Yo, dude, I'm nothing mm. without the people in my life. Mm. Zero. Walking alongside somebody isn't always just giving them an opportunity. Yes, right. It's telling them the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's holding them accountable. It's yeah. having hard conversations. And you can do all those things if yeah. people trust that you care yeah. about them. Mm -hmm. As each of you shared your story, you decided to listen. Yeah. You didn't just hear the words, you listened. Mm -hmm. And responded. 